Hello everybody, this is Project Alpha. My name is Nikolai Feldman and you're watching War Diary with Alexei Rostovich. Good evening, Alexei. Good evening. Say again. Coffee and buns, you know. All right. Um, let's start. Sorry to break your meal. Let's start with a bunch of news that I think the strikes on oil refiners is probably the biggest news we want to discuss today to start with. And people even mentioned to you that uh, you made a meme back in the day about the UAVs that are used. It kind of looked whatever was used in that uh, deep Russian factory looked like that meme that you used back in the day. And apparently we still continue hitting their oil refineries, despite the uh, Washington not recommending doing so. So Ukraine is continues to ignore what uh, Washington is advising us, or how should we interpret that? You know, that's interesting. Now, a poke towards people and one progressive party that um, made their career by praising Americans. Today, everybody published from their key speakers to the smallest village representatives, they published um, their concern with Blinken's statement. Half a year ago, these same people were attacking us for a much softer formulation. In October, we started talking about issues with American administration, the current administration, and uh, we fared a squall of fire from this party. But now I have a question to you, people from Yes, party. How do you dare now writing that about Americans? You're attacking your holier than thou saint figures, right? You're probably pushing Russian narrative, no? Well, listen, they. Well, listen, there is an interesting development. There was a photo of Nizhitsky, one of the congressmen in EU, right? of the same party representation. Right, that's the level of their discussion, Nikolai. When their opponent says something they don't like, or makes a mistake, God forbid, they squeal the loudest and they fire everything they have at you, screaming that you are a Russian spy. But has anyone, with those billion of checks that counter intel services of Ukraine did to me, did anyone catch me being a Russian spy? And now we have a situation when Knizhitsky was uh, captured and it looks very much, or detained rather, and uh, looks very much like a Russian spy or like a friend who keeps, a uh, person who keeps close friendship with Russian spies. And nobody on, from that party is commenting that situation. Doesn't it look like some censorship inside them, inside the org? No, it's not that, Nikolai. I think they just are uncivilized uh, group that do not know how to conduct discussion properly, do not know the rules of discussion and do not have inner freedom to do so. People who enforced writing into our constitution that we will be part of EU and NATO, probably not really fully understanding what we'll be facing there, because everything in the West is based on proper communication. And uh, staying mum is very Soviet-like, that's what we've been fighting with all the time. So why are you guys uh, behaving like you're some commies here, dear comrades? Or perhaps, like in Aristovich school, they actually teach people to imagine their opponent to be higher than the opponent can imagine himself. Because the stronger opponent you debate with, the faster you grow. Because you only grow when you really exert enough exercise and enough effort to grow and to overcome the obstacles. But when you start with painting your opponent as lowest than low, and that then you don't really grow and you can use some lowest level techniques that you would never use on somebody tougher. And yeah, that approach doesn't really let you grow. And I don't know if it'll ever lead us to NATO or EU. So speaking of uh, us misbehaving towards American directives, there are two options here. They allow us to hit, but formally make statements that they're against it. And second, when they don't uh, want us to hit those targets, and they formally also claim the same thing. I like the second option better, because it is our war, we need to win it. They have geopolitics game, and and we have our war. They have the question of expediency, and we're solving the question of survival. So thank God we've been hitting those targets, and we will continue hitting those targets as much and as often as we need to. 
All right, there is also a reaction from United Nations. I don't know how to interpret it at this point because they're linking it to the statement by the secretary of the press secretary. So we probably need to give a signal for people in Ukraine. How should we take the thesis uh, spurred by that uh, subsecretary? And how should we treat United Nations in this regard? Well, I would first of all wait a bit because the epoch of deep fakes is upon us and uh, words torn out of context, so it blinked on the radar and we didn't have enough time to check the details of it. And is it indeed the position of General Secretary? Perhaps he was uh, scared to state that himself and he sent his secretary to speak to this. And the point is that they are supposedly condemning our hit on the dormitory where workers of this uh, UAV plant live, the ones who are assembling those uh, Russian Shahid's UAVs. And I don't think we've been um, targeting this dormitory. There is an actual assembly facility 200 yards behind it. And frankly, you know, 200 yards over 1,200 miles, that's uh, within the margin of error, basically. So accusing us and targeting dormitories on purpose, that's silly. And also equating a dormitory of a factory where they assemble UAVs that fly onto our territory that kill our women and children to a civil object, this is too much, even for United Nations. And I would remind once again that um, that plurality of secretaries appeared after the Second World War as one of the systems created by the Potsdam-Yalta security system created by Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill. And uh, all these secretaries and United Nations is a rudiment, um, as an artifact of that system that has already failed. So with a very low effectivity, United Nations continues to roll, but uh, it's still better to have some platform than have no platform. And it has, frankly, a big uh, history of uh, not addressing issues like genocide in Rwanda and many other issues when United Nations was just sleeping. Or United Nations position on Israel, where they try to hold Israel's hands and not let them defend themselves. So this is a very leftist and at the same time imperialist structure that was created by Soviet Union, Britain and United States to keep everybody else at bay. And on one hand, give rights to small peoples and equalize them with the biggest of the countries. So that, for example, Cote d'Ivoire would have the same weight as United States in this org. On the other hand, this is an instrument of political pressure by creating formal majority. And we understand the instruments that are used to create these majorities. That's why I'm very skeptical about United Nations and everything they produce. And their statements and uh, estimations are causing a more skeptical approach. So they're usually on the side of aggressor. They're usually holding hands of defending side. It is a thought that United Nations, given their sternness of position against Israel, Ukraine needs to be thankful to UN for that not holding our hands tighter. Oh, they, they're going to. They're just uh, speeding up to that. Okay, then let's go to Ukrainian agenda, Alexei. Let's start with the interview of Vladimir Zelensky to American media. And he said a very interesting phrase that I actually recorded down when Putin will lose the territories that he acquired after the beginning of this war. That is when he will be ready for a dialogue. Do you think this framework for negotiations is adequate? Can, do you think we talk about that framework, that we need uh, to look at the framework of Putin losing all these uh, annexed territories before we start any discussions with him. We have two interesting events related to this phrase. First one is that our beloved president started talking about negotiations. What happened? Remember when uh, SBU came to Aristovich's uh, home after he started talking about negotiations? Or only the great ones are allowed to talk about negotiations and the little ones are not? What happened to the statement of the borders of 91? I'm deeply concerned as a citizen of Ukraine about it. Right. Um, and the second is that the topic of negotiations appeared again and he violated his own decree. So 
he needs to either cancel uh, the decree and decision by the Ukrainian Security Committee, or, you know, you just either denounce that decision, cancel it, or you're in violation of it. And now apparently we do have a path, right? So now we have moved the goal a bit. We're not going to the borders of 91, we're going to the borders of 22. This goal is much more achievable if our dear American partners in Europe give us enough arms. But shall they? Right? Nobody knows. Well, there are some signals like say that uh, perhaps they will. They have achieved some agreements, Mike Johnson, is adding the voting into agenda. Right, Nikolai, I'm hearing the same thing too, that we will be getting some arms the day today or tomorrow, right, as they say, check is in the mail. Um, so I'm sitting as that uh, famous sculpture, waiting. Um, there is also a publication by Welt that Ukraine and Russia will stop war in 2024, according to their publication. You know, all these framework that all that is going to happen, that this will stop 100%. Isn't it some hype that in the world trends the journalists are reacting and they're publishing to get more likes and viewings, relying on some independent and unknown sources? No, I don't think so, Nikolai. The journalists are actually trying to dig information and some politicians are indeed spilling some beans. And uh, there is something for us to discuss. There is definite motion happening. People are viewing, uploading, liking. We're doing the fundraisers. So, you know, the machine is working. <laughs> is it sarcasm, Alexei? Um, yeah, well, can there be peace in 2024? Sure, it can. Especially if Russia decides to go into some counter, counter, counter offensive this summer and uh, stalls and doesn't achieve anything and uh, basically flushes their capabilities down the drain, then perhaps the war will uh, stall at some front line and we might start discussing. And that's kind of what I think will happen. But I'm not sure if negotiations will occur. I think they will fail with their counter offensive. But um, sorry, Alexei, I lost myself a bit with the logic of actions, especially if we bring Putin into the picture. I'm not even talking about Americans. Perhaps, let's say, it's Russia, us and the collective West. So Putin, in his interviews, stated times and times again that he is working to get to negotiation point, and he wants negotiations, and he actually wants to get to some point where they can still make a decision. So about ceasefire and uh, ending this war, that Zelensky wouldn't even have to break his own decree about not negotiating. And remember, we had a stream a few times ago that um, we called a good uh, scenario, a probable scenario for quitting this war. So, with Macron's statements, with our continuous attacks on Russian refineries, did that position change or is it just a uh, squabble under the carpet? Well, we talked and let's talk again. Putin is in a very comfortable position, not in an ideal, but in a comfortable, because he can achieve the goals he is going for by both either military or peaceful methods. Because the moment when he gets us to negotiate and to agree to a ceasefire, he'll probably be given a peace award by United Nations and some other organizations. And as a result of that, he'll probably raise a question of raising some of the sanctions from Russia, and that would allow them to prepare for the second part of this war, five or ten years from now. So that's why I'm saying all negotiations with Russia in the current state do not make sense. War needs to go on until we break them far enough and uh, perhaps until Europe will awaken to reorganize and create a new security system in uh, Europe at large. That's what will stop this war. Until this happens, and it doesn't seem like anybody is talking about that yet, until that happens, um, he is in a comfortable position. And uh, the other point is that Russia is on the peak of its power right now. They have peaked their production, they have reached their maximum capacity, and they figured ways to sell their oil still. But if the situation will continue with the destruction of their refineries and with America and Europe pressing India and China to stop purchasing oil from Russia, then eventually Russia will start rolling down that peak. 
and they might find themselves in a very different position a year from now, when everything will be much sadder, right? Because right now they are at the peak of their strength and uh, the West is not. A year from now, situation may drastically change. And that's why they sincerely want to affix certain achievements while they are still in power, in a position of power. And our task is to destroy them as much as we can. Equipment, soldiers, oil refineries, everything that we find, uh, preferably military targets. Analyzing these publications, The Economist uh, published recently also that Russia is preparing for a big offensive And that's the information that Zelensky voiced as well, that at the end of May, beginning of June, that might occur. And they're talking that um, a slow situation on the front is beneficial for Russia, not for the West. Well, yeah, situation changed quite a bit. Um, it was profitable for Russia, while the West was not making decisions. But since the Europe made a decision that they will be fighting this war with Putin, even without the United States, the situation changed drastically. So everything that was said in autumn doesn't matter anymore. We have new circumstances and we need to evaluate in a new light. Right now, negotiations are not, op uh, not a good option for Ukraine. It's a great option for Putin. So right now we need to continue fighting with them and trying to break their attempt at counteroffensive. And as for their possible summer offensive, he did mention in Russia that they're going to The president said that they want to mobilize 300,000, but um, 150,000 of those will probably be a spring draft that will be just a two-year service draft. And probably part of them will be pushed to sign contracts after that, and they might be planning to bring some people to the drafting points to emphasize the current mobilization effort. So perhaps they might gather 300,000 because it looks scary enough, and it's half of what they already have on our territory and their growing overall number by one and a half times. But I do want to remember that, to remind us that 120,000 were concentrated on Avdivka. So with all this new effort, they might um, create, what, two new Avdivkas on the front, right? So all we need really to stop them is shells and FPV drones and make sure that we have enough uh, weapons and uh, munitions to fight them off. What I'm more concerned here is that our mobilization effort is walking too slow because our congressmen trying to preserve their political stance, they are sacrificing the future of the country to that. Because the law, the bill about mobilization still is not adopted, but now our Congress is going to spring holidays, right? They're resting now. And we're already late because in a good scenario, this uh, Putin's 300,000 should have arrived to the front after our 300,000 arrived there. And the situation that it unfolds now will likely suggest that first Russian troops will come there and then later our reinforcements will arrive. And that will create a very difficult situation on the front. And well, yeah, big thanks to our congressmen and women and um, remember their faces and remember who voted how on this bill. Wait, Zelensky did sign a bill this week about mobilization starting the age of 25. Yeah, this is just a correction to the current mobilization where they adjusted the lower bracket from 27 down to 25. That allows us to draft a bit uh, more people, but it's not the law itself, not the new law that we're talking about. When uh, they'll come out of their holidays, it'll be middle April, perhaps by the end of April it'll start working if they vote for it, and uh, maybe by June we will get some numbers drafted. And Russia, according to them, and according to Zelensky's statement, Russia is preparing 300,000 by June, right? So we are facing a new wave of that armada, and it's difficult on the front as is. So when they will add more effort to the front, it will be very difficult for our current fighters to hold them. In the meantime, our draftees will be still on their way to the front when they will already be fighting there, right? We're talking for how many months about this bill? I think it's a fifth month, right? We started in October. Exactly. So, yeah, that's uh, kind of like if you prepare to a conference an hour, an hour and a half before the conference starts. That's what we do. We're laughing at Russians that are gathering for six months the troops to take Avdivka and then spend four months taking it. 
In the meantime, we ourselves are spending almost half a year adopting a bill that will be probably our main test for sovereignty. We're adopting it for six months, despite all the pressure of circumstance. And in the meantime, the congressmen are uh, talking to all the reporters about the fight for survival, about Putin wanting to eradicate all the Ukrainians from the face of this earth, and he probably does. Why then so slow, dear comrades? Well, then there's a hi hypothesis that this bill has different goals, that it's not so needed. No, no, it's not so, Nikolai, it's not the bill that has different goals, it's our congressmen have different goals. But they're dependent from the office of the president, no? Not entirely, unfortunately in this case. Um, they're not voting altogether in different parties as well, and they spammed this bill with corrections, just Yulia Tymoshenko's block, how many corrections have they introduced, and then uh, there is a special committee who is also slow walking and reviewing every correction to all the protocols and details. They basically proceeding with CYA, cover your ass effort. Um, so they want to be absolutely proper and they don't want to sacrifice even a part of their reputation to expedite this bill. You know how I'm different from congressmen? For Ukraine, I destroyed my reputation to oblivion, scaring the West, scaring people here, to make sure they make the right decisions. And now after the West has uh, taken their strategic decision, I have a sense of accomplishment uh, in that replaced my lost reputation. But what do they feel after slow walking this critically important bill? I think they feel that there is no command from the office of the president. Well, right, it took them a while to even bring down the drafting age from 27 to 25 because they all want to be liked by the voters, by the mothers of those uh, guys who will be drafted. All right, take Israel as an example. Do you think Israeli mothers don't like their children, but their kids go from 19 to serve their country? Both boys and girls. And uh, what about our mothers? You're quoting Viktor Versner, who wrote a post today, right? Indeed, we're in the same stream. And uh, what our mothers don't uh, want their kids to go anywhere until they're 25 or 27 and shouldn't be touched before that. Thing is, these uh, people go to fight for, these uh, kids, in quotes, go to fight war to defend their mothers. So they would not be raped and killed like in Bucha or Izum or everywhere on the occupied territories. And the office is afraid to take unpopular decisions. Right the true champions of taking responsibility in times of war. And I'm all out of expletives today, so let's go to the next question, please. All right, so that we don't have to do any post-production to this stream. Um, okay. There is a good story about guarantees uh, from the Western countries. Bilateral agreement was signed by Ukraine and Finland today. President of Finland and Vladimir Zelensky signed this document. It has 89 articles. And again, this is not a guarantee. This is a document regulating relations and support for each other. Well, this is a good success for the office and we cannot criticize them in this regard. We need to applaud them. This is a seventh country that uh, we signed this kind of agreement with. And I don't know any other country who can boast something like that, that they have guarantees about uh, aid and transfer of military equipment and material means to support each other during the times of war. Um, so this is great. Whenever they make strong moves, I will definitely applaud them. And this is definitely one of their strengths, the external politics. So once again, a note to the viewers from the office of the president, we try to be objective. You're great when you're doing great things and we criticize you when you're doing something stupid. All right, there were more messages this week about the number of people who are dodging the draft in Ukrainian regions. And apparently we have 40,000 criminal cases. They're transferred to police to search for people who are dodging the draft. 40,000 in ivano frankovsk region and 30,000 in Poltava region. So it seems like just two regions. If these people are discovered, we have 70,000 resource. If you talked before 
that 40,000 is a dire need every month for the front, right? I understand this also is limited somewhat by training capabilities, but altogether we need, I don't know how much, maybe 400,000. Right, that's roughly a quarter of what Putin is going to draft. Just in two regions, right? In two regions. And it's a tenth of what's fighting against us on the whole territory of Ukraine, actually a ninth part of that. So, same points here. If the war doesn't have positive goals, then it's very difficult to motivate people with negative. And we don't have positive goals. For those who hear it for the first time, positive goals are the goals that formulated from the plus to acquire something. And negative are the ones that allow you to get rid of something. We only have negative goals in this war, officially defined. That's why I'm saying we cannot fight on a strategic level. Not that we cannot destroy enemies, life force and equipment. That we can do just fine. But formulating the goals of war, positive goals of war, we are failing in this. The only positive goal we had was joining EU and NATO. But that is problematic not because of us, but because of EU and NATO, because you should not be posturing uh, goals that are dependent upon the externalities, right? And the main weakness of our country during this war and the socio-system of Ukraine is inability to formulate positive goals. Negative goals, they are very poor motivators, especially when there are a lot of other drawbacks related to how people are drafted, how they're trained and how they're used. So. We're fighting as we can, and we're dodging as we can, right, as a society. And that's a diagnosis to our society at large. I'm glad there are people who are still fighting and who go to the drafting points when they get the writ, and um, very few actually have to be caught. Most, the largest, the wide, widest majority of our soldiers are going at their own volition. And that's a good sign of some health of our society when people understand consequences and they do not want negative consequences to dawn upon their families and close ones. But if we had positives, then it would have been much easier. It's either that or a very strong negative. For example, Israel has a member of Holocaust and the threat by their neighbors to repeat some of it. But. Um, we have what we have, right? I'm glad we are where we are with this and we still have enough volunteers. So let's look at Israel. What uh, positive goals do they have? Israel is a bit different, Nikolai. They have very strong negative. Never again is there a national motto and the memory about Holocaust is being transferred within each family. Plus every day Palestinians remind them of this by either a terrorist act or attempt to kill a policeman or a soldier with a knife or uh, intifadas, uh, all those routes that they had. So they have very, very strong negative motivation. We unfortunately do not have a strong negative. We have a negative, but it's not as strong as uh, Israel. And negatives are fine, they create emotions, but emotions, they do not create proper motivation. Emotion can escalate you for maybe a day, for 15 minutes um, after you've read the news. And if you bet on emotion, it doesn't last. Emotions do not motivate. The worldview motivates, reasoning motivates. Our internal messaging is very weak. We think that propaganda must be addressed at the enemy. This is the main mistake of a dilettante. Propaganda needs to motivate your own, first of all. Because telling Russians that they're pig dogs, that's a fantastic story, but eventually, at some point, it starts to motivate them. Why we're not being told who we are? What is our legacy? When we're turning to a potential recruit, why we're not telling him that he's a descendant from Svetoslav Vladimir the Great, Yaroslav the Wise, all the Cossacks? You are carrying their legacy now, the heroes of the First World War, the Second World War, and the others. There's a whole row of glorious forefathers. Do you want to break this chain so your ancestors would look at you with despise? That you were the ones to, the one to break the glorious story of Ukraine and Ukrainian military? This is one story. And the other story, what we have is when we don't address our people almost completely, and then we only talk about the pig dogs on the other side. And then if they're weak and stupid, why go fight? Right? They're weak. So this is uh, an effort conducted by a lot of dilettantes, unfortunately. And another wrong point, it's trying to prove our righteousness and 
lack of uh, that on the enemy side. And the main mistake the propaganda can do is that it'll try to prove that the enemy doesn't have truth. And this is wrong. Everybody has his own truth. Palestinians have their own truth. Putin has his own truth. Or like in Oliver Stone's platoon, excuses are like assholes, Taylor. Everybody got one. So you should not be trying to prove that the enemy is wrong. We should be trying to prove that we are right. And the fact that the enemy is right should be written on their graves. But for that you need talented people to work in propaganda and media. Where do you find them, though? All the talented ones are leaving and running away from our system, the way it is currently built. Some few still holding on, and that's why our country is still standing. All right, let's go to France. That's where I want to jump right now, Alexei. France said that it can actually engage directly with Russia, and uh, mass media talked about five different options that Macron has on his table. The first one is that France is building, could be building military factories in Ukraine using their engineering capabilities. Second, they would be helping Ukraine to clean the mines. Third, they could be covering Odessa and some other cities with their aerial defense. Fourth, France could, France could deploy their troops to create a defensive zone and take some of the tasks from Ukrainian troops. And the fifth is uh, French troops are fighting in trenches together with Ukrainians. That probably will cause a third world war to happen. And I, I'm not seeing the option that we've been discussing with you before, that France could probably deploy on the border with Belarus and alleviate some of our troops from carrying out this duty. That right now we have to keep on the northern border and some parts of northern front. So, according to the open media that are discussing these scenarios, Ukraine is holding a 100,000 troop group on the border with Belarus, because it's a thousand miles border. And even if you're not expecting any serious incursion from that side, you still need about that number to cover it, to fight with uh, diversions and possible intruders. So for France to pick it up for Belarus, that would be 50,000 at least, right? Half of what we have. This is a very difficult proposition because it will be probably a fifth of all their troops, available resources in France. So probable, but not uh, necessarily desirable. And the rest of scenarios are more probable that are being discussed. What's important here is not even that. It seems there is symbolic presence here and readiness to clash with Putin and to fight him. Because Putin's side is claiming that will be their priority target if France appears on the front, that they will be targeting it. And uh, it will be stupid to expect French to just uh, weather the blows. They will actively engage. And then we can discuss more about uh, who and how and how many. It doesn't. That's not so important. What's important is that they're ready to bring. Right. As long as they are ready to fight, even if one of their soldiers gets killed, that's already a good message. Um, okay. Thank you, Alexei. Among the enemies, we hear these discussions. They're very seriously discussing France, and they're saying that you can be laughing at French all you want, but they have the biggest army in Europe. They probably will use foreign legions to aid Ukraine, one of the most battle-worthy detachments in Europe. If their Mirage's aviation will be fighting to support them, that will be a very difficult situation. We should not be approaching that proposition lackadaisically. We should consider it with all grave uh, seriousness. Poles, by the way, are saying that they are not going to enter the fight, but Besides the French, uh, Czech troops and perhaps some troops from Baltic countries might uh, appear on the territory of Ukraine. Romania will not engage, but they will be providing logistics. They have a NATO base in Constance. So that's what um, they're discussing in Russia in details who can enter. They're moving this chess on the board. What do you think that indicates? Do you think they're seriously getting ready for it? Yeah, I think they're calculating and somewhat fearful. They have some clear heads that understand the threats, but they're still in the wrong position, basically trying to say that we should be estimating them as a serious uh, force. The fact is that if French come, especially with their aviation, Russia will definitely lose. So Russia right now is an industrial fa factory for producing smoke and mirrors. 
they're creating that fake imagery that Russia is so strong that you don't even need to fight it. In the meantime, we're kicking their butt on the front, have been kicking for two years. We've sunk their Black Sea fleet. We've hit their factories uh, 1,200 kilometers away from the front. Even Germany had never reached that when they were fighting with Russia, Soviet Union. So all these stories about uh, yeah, France will be a serious addition to the front. The reality is that all these Su-35s that Russia has, if they are facing mirages, the fourth for plus plus generation of jets in Europe, they will not be standing a chance. It also depends upon how France will come, right? I don't think it's realistic to expect their troops here, however, but what is realistic that they will be sending way more military equipment. And that's uh, what it seems like they were going to do first. And just that will be fantastic for us. Here in all these iterations and scenarios, it's not even important whether mirages will be flying over our heads and shooting down MiGs. At this point, it's not important. What's important at this stage is that they are ready, and they're expressing their readiness out in the open. This factor changes the whole supposition on the, far, on the front. And how they will fight, what they will do, they, they will never be able to bring a serious enough group to be comparable with our troops on the front, right? We have 1,300,000, Russia has 600,000 on the front. They can bring maybe, what, 20,000, maybe 50,000? What is it? Two army corps. So they can do maybe change events on one direction. And that, that is not a big strategic change. But just readiness of France to engage, that's a big story. All right, Alexei, but very often declarations differ with what they do. And I want to touch upon the situation with uh, artillery shells that Czech Republic was talking about. I still have, I'm not clear. Have we got them? Are they on the way? Now the different price points are being discussed for these shells. At first, the price was quoted that Czechs are going to spend 1.5 billion euros for 800,000. And that's about 1,875 euros per shell. And then there was another publication by Estonian Minister of Defense who states that the shells on the Czech contract will be costing 3 billion euros for 1 million of shells, and that's already 3,000 per shell. So it appears that there is some trade going on, that somebody decides to make some money on this deal. What is happening? Well, of course, Nikolai, when these big deliveries are being discussed and big numbers, uh, monitoring numbers, somebody wants to make money on it, of course. I'll tell you the story about these shells after the war. Actually, I can tell you after the stream, just not publicly yet. There is a very funny nuance with these shells, and it's entertaining when you look at it in abstract, but it's not entertaining if you're a Ukrainian warfighter on the front. But I think ultimately everything will be okay with them. But for now, our troops are still complaining about the lack of ammo. Right, that's true. And after Avdiivka, there was a good moment when we had enough. That has been already spent, Nikolai. Right, so we have the issue again. And that issue raises its head significantly. Two weeks ago, they were talking about having these new shells three weeks. In three weeks, but uh, now we're looking forward and we understand that there might be some more time before they arrive. I'll tell you, Nikolai, after the stream, what's up with this. Am I allowed to have this information? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think you might, but as you like. Anyway, okay. So, given that there are different declarations, there was one formulation for this deal than the other, and French with their declarations, do you think they can also walk back what they stated? Or, no, for that, Nikolai, this is a guaranteed decision. It is already provided financially, it is being provided uh, with politically, and it's being realized within French industrial complex as well. For this, we can be pretty calm. But uh, shells, yeah, that's an open issue. By the way, French declared in the open sources that out of everything that the military industrial complex will produce, 85% will be sent to Ukraine. So that's good. Every month we're getting new lines of support. They're slow, but they're opening. And right, Alexei, there was information that France is one of the countries that has not donated their part of uh, monies to buy out these Czech shells, uh, artillery shells. Well, yeah, they actually are giving their own shells, because the kind of shell they're giving for Caesars, for their uh, equipment that they donated to Ukraine, they are different from any other system. And uh, by the way, Ukraine is aiding NATO to standardize everything because, fantastically, French shells do not match German shells, German uh, artillery. 
So France already donated us scissors. They promised us a little bit under 100 more, and they will be providing ammunition for them. So that's pretty clear. They'll be supporting these systems. That's different type of artillery shells. To clarify, while we touched upon that, President Zelensky said in his interview to an American journalist that our goal is five or seven patriots. We need it right now. Can anyone else provide these systems to us, or it's always the United States? Well, PAC-3, the third complex, uh, is uh, very advantageous against uh, anything or versus any other system. This is the only one that can shoot hypersonic and uh, ballistic missiles that destroys its warhead. Because it's important to destroy the warhead, if it is especially a nuclear warhead, you need to disable it so that it would be falling without exploding. And this is a very difficult task to calculate. Very few systems can calculate this. This is basically anti-missile defense. We do have it, and it covers Kiev and a couple other places, but we're critically lacking it for the size of the country that we are, and we can see it. When Odessa gets hit, when Dnipur and Kharkov get hit, but, on the other hand, Harkov is being shot by S-300s. Patriot can intercept S-300, but the warhead for S-300 uh, costs, let's say, two, three hundred thousand dollars, and Patriot missile costs from one to six millions. So this is very costly defense. And Russians know that we'll never be able to cover all the targets. Even if we get these five, seven Patriots, we'll be able to cover only some of them. But the president also said one more important thing, that all the patriots that we were given, they are not from America, they are from other allies. So where are our glorious American friends? Where are you, American friends? Can't see you. So Americans were saying in the first year of war, the politics was to rearm the countries that are giving Ukraine their own equipment. So if somebody donated Patriot to Ukraine, then they would get a replacement Patriot from America. Are they not giving those Patriots to those countries? Oh no, they, they are. They're doing it. The West has one fantastic characteristic, in my view. It starts to act when they figured out how they can make money on it. When they figure it out, that's when they start to act. And Europe started to become really active when they figured how to make money on moving troops, on creating that Eastern Wall, Eastern Defense. Now they figured it. Unfortunately, I cannot voice that elegant scheme on air, but they are now doing it and making money and enjoying the process. And America, 75% of uh, donations given to Ukraine remain in the territory of the United States because that money goes to manufacturers in the United States and they donate us some old equipment. But even old equipment is good. It's just the problem is that it's being given very unsystematically, right? In the United States, they have 1,200 Patriot systems, 1,200. To cover Ukraine, ideally, we need 50. Not batteries, not divisions, just systems. And to better situation drastically over the key objects, we probably need maybe 20, 20, 25. For Americans, that is nothing. That's a drop in the ocean. They could have given it yesterday, but... Yeah, somebody can do it with his decision, you think, Biden? Yeah, he can, but he's not. They can uh, sign Land Lease 2 into action, and you can transfer all arms of the United States military if you want to. This is his personal position of Biden's administration and um, their personal responsibility. Now, after the ninth, Republicans promised to bring in for voting their package of aid for Ukraine, and we'll see how administration will react to that. It is disconnected now from Taiwan and Israel aid, just Ukraine. All right, Czech Republic has revealed a scheme the way Russia was bribing European bureaucrats. Czech uh, publication and authorities are saying that they revealed a scheme that Russia was using to bribe congressmen in Europe. 
and the system that allowed to spur Russian propaganda in Europe. The details of that scheme were revealed and published. Czech powers uh, commented on the situation and Czech media published the details of the schema. The government of Germany expressed their concern because it was German congressmen that were presented as uh, examples in this bribery scheme. So, is there anything we can comment about it? Any consequences? How was it set up? Was it be, will it be the same way as with sanctions in Britain for those who were circumnavigating the sanctions and were never punished for it? What do you expect from this story? Not too much, Nikolai, because politicians are setting the legal framework. Political decision precedes the legal framework. And it's difficult to approach the other way from the scandal to elevate that to politician level. Perhaps on the eve of elections that can be used as a card, but I do not expect serious consequences out of this scandal. And it's only two months till elections of European Parliament, so probably it will affect this way. But as for us, we do know that Russia has a gigantic machine in Europe to spread their influence, information, practical, monetary, etc. A ton of European politicians are engaged in it, leaders of public opinion. Many of them are working for Russia directly, and they're bribed directly, but many don't even know that they were bribed by Russian money. They think that they're taking care of their local and European problems, but the vectors that they're going about them are such that it aids Russia. For example, many ultra-lefts or ultra-rights in Europe. Russian special services, same as Soviet predecessors before that, they bring every matter into the question of power. Ecology, building a new factory, adding something to the city, it's a matter of power. And the moment you look at something as a resource of power, it paralyzes very often the current legal system and power system in the country. And many people in Europe, many politicians work with the fifth or sixth generation of Russian money, the money that entered Europe in the 80s and 70s. And it's a third or fourth generation is working on those money now conducting pro-Russian vectors, thinking that they're pro-European patriots. But even if you count just the direct ones who are getting direct bribes from Russia, there's a ton of those. For example, in Belgium, there was an interesting publication in the open media that there are 88 bloggers or leaders of public opinion who are conducting Russian agenda, right? That was, I think, in 21 or 22 when I saw it. And Belgium is a small European country. It's small by population, by its size. So many people, so many bloggers. I don't think we can find 88 liters of public opinion blogging in Ukraine. In Belgium, they're having 88 conducting Russian agenda. What do our embassies do in all these countries? The day of Borscht and the day of Ukrainian shirt, right? They're very they're keeping low, they're keeping their head low and not really conducting any influence. Russian diplomacy works very differently. It suffered a lot and they lost a lot of capabilities, but they still are on a level higher than we. And the way you create this influence, you help politician to grow. You help him to make decisions that will position him right to his potential electors. You help him to get right meetings. They introduce a politician, a budding politician to the system, to the network that will depending upon your personal interests and qualities and geographical localization will aid you to rise. So there are whole nets, networks that are helping politicians to grow. It's a very delicate work and it needs a lot of money and best minds to be carried out. And it's usually being built over decades and Russia still inherited some of it from Soviet Union. Ukraine, unfortunately, doesn't know how to play that game. That game Russia was doing, still doing, and these publications continue to appear. Do you think European special services will react? Will it become a driver for action for them that might eventually prevent Russian influence to a degree or limit it to some capacity? Well, this is a matter of political influence too, because the leadership of these secret services is always political. The vice directors, the second in command, are usually professionals, but the top level is always political. And it's difficult to revert that influence 
to become a leader versus uh, politics being a leader in decision making. This is not easy. And it's also European courts, right? You may know everything, but you'll need to prove it in court. So that's a serious problem. But of course, it takes work, and I think they are informing acting politicians, they're revealing things, they're indicating certain Russian vectors, they're doing and trying, but they need to continue. But this problem is way bigger than just special services. This is the problem of politics, of information, economic politics. You know how it works? It's not like somebody comes with a pirate insignia and a big cash of money and saying, hey, I'll buy whoever wants to join me. It's the subtle politics of influence. It starts with economic cooperation, then cultural cooperation. Right now, cultural cooperation has uh, suffered a bit, but after economic agreement on something, they would normally invite you to the embassy evening of some Russian culture, and here we have some books or new movies for the movie festival. And then you go together to some party to discuss the victory or the score that Russian alternative movie had uh, scored at the Berlin movie festival. And that's where you get acquainted with the congressman from Bundestag. And then apparently you suddenly have a common interest like cricket or golf. And then according to legend, that uh, person of influence is uh, supposedly an avid golf player, so he starts playing, taking golf lessons. Then, for example, he damages his hand or pretends that he did, so he doesn't look too awkward on the field, but he still uses it to maintain friendship with that congressman. And now imagine that going on with thousands of people. That's a lot of influence. And you can get a certain effect if you push that system to make certain decision and to vector the country in a certain way. End of part one.